We've now covered everything that we need to know for the flight planning exam. So let's actually apply that knowledge and answer some questions. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the study session for the flight planning exam. What we're going to do today is we're going to use a question bank in order to answer some questions related to flight planning. This way we can make some mistakes, learn from it and generally give ourselves a bit more knowledge for going into the exam. Welcome to the study session for flight planning and monitoring. Uh, we're going to be using the Airhead ATPL question bank to do this. Um, they've kindly given me a discount link that I can pass on to you guys. Uh, it's down in the description below you should get a 10% discount on anything, uh, any subscription that you purchase. And they asked me just to tell you a few things. So the first thing is they've got a new app, which I've actually played about with a little bit. It's quite good. Uh, the main thing that I like is it's offline. So if you're ever uh, on a train or on a plane and you don't have access to the internet, you can download, you can see this sync data feature, you can download various uh, questions and tests and keep practicing when you are up in the air or something like that. Um, it's still in beta. There's a link down below in the description to get hold of it. It's not, I don't think it's on the app stores yet. It might be on the app stores by the time you watch this video. Um, and yeah, you can see all the main features of a question bank, your search function, your uh, exams, um, the three main menus, you can see home practice search exam account are the same that we get on the main website, which is here. So obviously on the main website, we've got home practice search exam and your account. Um, and for my setup today, we're just going to be doing a practice. So we'll practice some questions. I've done a few practice practice questions just to make sure I don't completely mess up the whole thing. We're going to be doing all topics in flight planning and monitoring. We're going to continue from there. Um, we're going to do questions of seeding the exam, top quality only. We can either select the last 100 uploaded, 200 uploaded, 300 uploaded. We don't want ones I've seen before. We're going to use all question providers that are available to us. And um, we'll exclude similar questions from different question banks. So we have a nice round uh, view of all the questions that are available to us. And we don't want to do 1,300. Let's just do 20, a nice short um, practice session. Another new feature they've got is that you can change the examining authority. You could select the country specific that you are in. Um, I think it's better just to go for all examining authorities. Well, for my purposes, because um, people watching this live all over the place. So I can't, I don't want to narrow in on one specific country's um, examining authority. But obviously you might want to do that because you know you're only gonna be flying in uh, Germany or only going to be flying in Italy or something like that um, but yeah that's a new feature so you can filter everything very specifically to what you want I want to have the immediate satisfaction of giving me the correct answers just after I try and select them uh, we won't submit my answer automatically we won't go to the next question automatically and we won't show a countdown timer so let's go Okay, so question one, refer to the figure. You're cruising a flightable 380 with a twin engined jet airplane. Due to airspace restrictions, ATC instructs you to reduce your speed to Mach 0.786. Given the following information, what is the fuel will you, you will use for the remainder of the cruise time? Distance top descent is 310, aircraft mass 60,000, TAT is minus 22, average wind is 25 knot headwind, consider a constant aircraft mass of 60,000 for calculation. So we're not gonna be reducing our mass because of fuel burn, but we're going to be changing our flight time. Um, reduce to max 786, doesn't say from what. So we're gonna do 786 for 310 knock miles and we're at flight level 380. So let's get some basic information out here. So let's see what we've got here. We're at 380 and I've immediately forgotten all the information. Um, 
max, 786 at 380. We're at 60,000 kilograms, 380. Max 786 is there. So, if I've got a M1 percentage, that doesn't matter. True, or indicate air speed's 249 knots indicated. Um, that's 0.786, Mach 0.786. Fuel flow per engine is 1.087 per engine. And our true airspeed, that's the one we want, is 451 knots, TAS. Okay, that's the information. I've actually just realized I've not shared my screen there. So that's the information we've got. We don't actually really care about the indicated airspeed, we're interested in the true airspeed. And we're gonna do uh, whatever the wind was, which was a average headwind component of 25 knots. Actually, no, there's a, there's a true air temperature there, which makes me think there might be some corrections. There is. Okay, so increase or decrease required percentage M1 by 1% 1 per five degrees above below standard TAT. Uh, increase, decrease fuel flow by 3% per 10 degrees above slash below standard. So it was 32 and we are minus 22. So we're going to, uh, we are above it by 10 degrees. So we're gonna increase it by 3%. So times 1.03 to get that 3%. And we've got to increase the true airspeed by one knot per one degree above or below standard. So we are above because it's minus 22. So that's 10 knots faster in terms of TAS. So our TAS is 461. And if we do a quick calculation on our fuel flow, uh, 1,087 with a 3% increase means that our fuel flow is going to be um, what is it? One, 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 nine point six. If you do that in the calculator, so there's our figures with the corrections. Then we've got a speed distance time calculation to do. Speed is going to be four hundred sixty one minus the twenty five knot headwind, because that's the ground speed that we're actually going to. That's the time it's going to take us to fly along those 310 nautical miles. So 461 minus 25 is 436. That's our speed equals the distance, 310 over the time. Time is going to be uh, 0 0.7110 hours. Um, and we could convert that into hours and minutes and stuff like that, but it doesn't really matter because we know we're going to be burning 1,119 per engine. So 1,119.6 times the two engines gives us this 2239.2 times by the time that we're going to be flying for should give us an answer. And I've got that as 1,592.1 in terms of, what is it, kilograms per hour? Yeah, that makes sense. So the closest answer there I've got is 1590. Let's check if that's right. Correct. Good, good start. So if I just hide that, we'll have a look at the little explanation feature. There's little features in the questions which I quite like. Um, You've got the uh, option to view similar questions. You can save it to a new collection. You can add little notes on the questions if you want to. That's your personal notes, so only you can see them. You can highlight it as you've seen this in the exam. You can view the comments, which I quite like. Um, so where does it say that the fuel flow is only for one engine? I didn't double the answer as the table didn't indicate that the fuel flow for one engine only, and then the guy above him says it's fuel flow per engine, meaning fuel flow per engine. 
So a little bit of confusion and a clarification from a fellow student, a fellow aspiring pilot, which is quite good. And then you've got the explanations, which are done by uh, professionals in the ATPL, uh, Airhead, Airhead ATPL office. So basically they're telling us what we just did. They looked at the actual true air, temp true air temperature at 3 zero is minus 22. So we've got the 10 degree correction to do on various things such as the fuel flow, uh, the percent gem one, the true air speed. That's just talking through the process that I did on my phone. So next question, refer to figure, yeah, that figure in the air traffic service flight plan item 15 for a flight along a designated route where the departure aerodrome is not on or connected to that route. In the ATS flight plan item 15, so in item 15 of the flight plan, for a flight along a designated route where the departure aerodrome is not on or connected to that route departure, you would normally have a, what's this actually showing? It's not actually giving us examples. So 15 is the uh, route, yes. So the 80s flight plan, with it, this is quite a weirdly worded question. Okay, so to me, the most logical thing, it's been a while since I filled out a flight plan properly, but you need to give the first point on your route. That's a given. And normally you would have a SID that you follow, but this is saying the departure aerodrome is not on or connected, so there is no SID standard end of an instrument departure to get to our route. So the letters direct DCT should be entered followed by the point of joining the ATS route. That seems reasonable. It is not necessary to indicate the point of joining that route as it will be obvious to the ATS unit. No, you've got to indicate where you're joining the route. The words as cleared should be entered. No, that's, that's too wordy. Uh, we're all look, always looking for codes and shorthands and stuff like that on the flight plan. And the next one down says it is necessary only to give the first reporting point on that route. Do we do so one or four? I think it's going to be four because you do some normal departure procedure out of an airport, whatever they want you to do. And then the first reporting, no, because the first reporting point might be different from the point of joining the route. Yeah, tricky one. Okay, we'll we'll go for this. Might get it wrong, but we'll learn something. We didn't get it wrong. Okay. So what are the comments saying? Somebody saw it in their exam. If the airport was also a waypoint or route, you could start your flight plan with the route. It really happens, but it's a flight planning possibility. Um off of page three. Okay. Explanation. Insert direct between successive points unless both points are defined by geographical coordinates or by bearing and distance. Okay, so refer to the Jepson GSPRM training route manual Alicante charts. Those charts <laughs> arriving at Alicante via the Calles 1 Romeo or Valencia 1 Romeo, select the correct VOR approaches. So this will be the SID star chart, uh, the star chart here. So Calles 1 Romeo. Valencia 1 Romeo, Calles 1 Romeo, Valencia 1 Romeo, they're Romeo 28 CDAs. So the Calles 1 Romeo is this one, and the Valencia 1 Romeo is this one. So we end up at Besor from Valencia or Calles for Romeo 28. So from way, that's Romeo 10, that's not it. This one here. That's VOR Zulu runway 10, that's not it. Up the top, VOR X-ray runway 28, and it starts at Besor up there, that works. So VOR X-ray 28, and we've got VOR Zulu runway 28, again, starting from Besor. So we've got, that was runway 28, X-ray, and Zulu. VOR X-ray, VOR Zulu. Um, I'm going to select that but not finalize it, just double check. So VOR Zulu was correct. VOR Yankees in both these, is that onto runway 10? VOR Yankees onto runway 10. So yes, this is the correct answer. 
explanation refer to the charts um yeah that's just making sure you understand where an arrival ends and where um it's quite a simple question it's just going to be reading the chart get familiar with the charts you can see the one Romeo, one kilo, one Romeo, one kilo, and actually locating them on the, oh, look, oh, I didn't know that. You can actually zoom into the, there you go. They're continuously adding new features. That's something I didn't even realize they've uploaded. I've been playing about this the last couple of days. So you have Valencia, one Romeo, and the Calle's one Romeo going to Bessor, and actually tells you on the chart there, VOR Zulu approach, VOR X-ray approach. There you go. That's good. Good that. Didn't realize you could zoom in. Might come in handy. Okay, the fourth question then. A turbojet airplane is flying using the following data. Turbojet, jet aircraft, class A. Good stuff. So, cruise level is optimum. The cruise speed is Mach 0.8. Mass is 190,000 kgs. It's ISA. Tailwind of 100 knots, lucky lucky pilots, going to get somewhere quite fast. And then the fuel mileage and the fuel consumption per hour are. So we got Mach 0.8. I'm just writing these figures down in my phone so I can see them easily when I'm looking at the uh, table there. So temperatures, ISA. And um, we've got tailwind of 100 knots. Uh, fuel mileage and consumption per hour. So let's have a look. Is this one able to zoom as well? Look at that. I'm amazed by that. <laughs> okay, so Mac 0.8. Uh, we're in the correct chart. It says Mac uh, 0.80. Yes, Mac 0.80. I was like, is that Mac, Mac 8 for a second? That's a very fast flight, but Mac 0.8. 190,000 kilograms down the side here. Um, what are these values at the top? Weight, chair speed, ISA. Oh, that is the. Okay, so we've got distance and time in there. Ooh, zooming doesn't actually help that much. So 190.86583. And eight six one, and that's minutes and nautical miles. Is that correct? And true speed four five nine. We don't need to know that. And then we've got corrections at the bottom here. It doesn't say anything in the question about pack flow, anti ison, uh, or anything like that, does it? Tailwind component of a hundred knots. Is there anything in there that mentions tailwind? I don't think so. Max Cruise, that's normal air conditions, anti-icing. Mac 8 is optimum, that's what we're doing. True speed, fuel mileage, and the fuel consumption per hour. What is going on here? I'm a bit confused. 861 minutes and 6583. No, neither of them are the answer. 190,000 kilograms, 0 0.8, The fuel mileage and the fuel consumption per hour. So that's knock miles and minutes, not fuel consumption. What? What? There's fuel consumption per hour. What is going on? There's not even a fuel consumption there. That's distance and nautical miles. Right. I'm a bit confused with this. I'm just going to pick a random answer and hopefully the explanation can shed some light on it. So that was wrong. Apparently it was 105 or per 1,000 kilograms, 530 kilograms per hour in the explanation. It's telling us that it's a true air speed of 459 times 850 minutes. We calculate the fuel flow by subtracting 60 minutes from the 850 minutes, resulting in 700, 
92 minutes, correspond this time with the weight. Subtract this weight from 109 to a fuel flow, determine the correct speed by adding 100 to the TAS. Right, confused by that. But it's good to make these mistakes, learn, and have a look back at your mistakes and figure out what went wrong. If the actual in-flight wind produces a greater headwind than forecast, the wind input into the FMC... Uh, if, if Question 5. If the actual in-flight wind produces a greater headwind than the forecast wind put into the FMC, what should be expected? So the actual in-flight wind produces a greater headwind. So we're going to be flying slower, burning more fuel. What should be expected? The ultimate flight level will be lowered. Earlier ETAs will be generated by the FMC. A new cruise level will be generated by the FMC. Speeds will be increased to maintain the estimated times of arrival. That sounds correct to me. So basically when you're flying a jet, you pop in all your information into the flight management computer, the FMC, and the automatic flight system and flight management system will control the speed in order to achieve um, expected times of arrival or it can fly according to something called a cost index which makes basically is like an efficiency level um, how efficient do you want to be how much fuel do you want to burn or how fast do you want to fly and it will manage your speeds for you so if you've got a larger headwind than what you've put into the FMC the only thing that's going to happen is the speeds are going to increase to try and keep you flying the way that you've asked the FMC to fly. Bit complicated. Um, oof, you can read that whole explanation if you want, you can pause the video. I'm pretty sure I know how an FMC works. So so giving the following NOTAM information, what airspace restriction has to be taken into account. So with effect, there's a danger area, EPD25, DEBA, um, is active. The lower limit is the ground, the upper limit is flight level 100, uh, no TAM reference is EP danger area 12225. End of bulletin. Danger area EPD25 is activated from 16th of the month of 401 until 6 UTC. 16.0401 till 6 UTC. Sounds good. Is effective the 1st of April 2016. 1st of April, where's getting that? 16.0401 from 0600. Hmm. I don't think it's that. I don't think it's specific. I think it's normally just by the month. Um, The date of the month, sorry. But 401 seems like a strange time, doesn't it? Uh, number three, active, effective from the 4th of January 26. No, that's definitely not right. Active, effective until 1st of April 2016. Um, I think it's probably the second one, you know, because 16th of the month, 401 is, sounds a bit strange. And no times are a lot longer data um, generally than weather information. So you might need to specify which month it's in, in case it spans multiple months. Like if there's runway works going on that span multiple months, you want to be clear on which months. Is it the 2nd of January or is it the 2nd of February that it's finishing or is it the 3rd of March or the you know, 4th of April or whatever. So I'm going to go for question two, answer two. With effect stands for with effect. The NOTAM, notice the airman time and represented by a 10 digit date time group denoting the year, month, day, hour, and minute. So year, 2016, month, April, the first, at 0600. Yes. Cool. Okay, question seven then. Given the distance from departure to destination 210, safe endurance, true track, wind vector, or wind velocity, true airspeed, What's the distance from the point of safe return from the departure point? So point of safe return, we're going to need ground speeds. So first thing first, 
is I'm going to calculate the uh, ground speed of the home and back legs because we'll need both. So if we think about the outward bound leg, outward leg is going to be uh, the true track of 035, but the wind is 250. So the difference there is quite significant actually. So let's just draw that out. 035 is like here, and 250 is about here. So the difference between that, 250 to 360 is um, 110. And then we've got 35 more, so 145 degree angle, which means it's actually off center by 1545, 35, sorry, 35 degrees off. So that's gonna be a tailwind for out and a headwind for back the way. And the strength of that is 20 knots. And to find out the headwind or the tailwind component, we multiply by cosine. So cosine 35 times the strength, which is 20, will give us our tailwind component. Pop that into a calculator and we will get a value of 16. So we've got 60 knot head or tailwind. In the case for us on this first leg, our outbound wind is 105 plus 16, uh, which is going to be, uh, what's that, quick maths in my head, 121. And then on the way back, it's going to be 105 minus that 16 knot, because it's now turned around and it's going to be uh, affecting us. It's going to be blowing directly in our face. So there we go. We've got two values for our speeds. We can now delete that stuff and pop in our calculation uh, for point of safe return, which is the time to the point of safe return equals the uh, the homeward, which is 89 times the endurance. The endurance is 2.5 hours over the, um, was it O plus H? So 121 plus 89. Um, so we've got 130 plus the 80 is one, uh, 210. And the time to our point of safe return, pop this into a calculator, 89 times 2.5 divided by 210. And that's 1.05, 1.0, six hours and then we want to work out the distance so quick speed distance time the speed from the departure point so it's going to be our outbound speed 121 knots for 1.06 hours gives us our distance uh, it should give you about 128 nautical miles uh, 127 we'll go for that Yes. So the explanation says, um, I've just popped that up below my phone. There we go. Uh, endurance is 2.5 hours. Out is 120, so they've just done the maths a bit more. They've just rounded a bit differently. 88 and 120, that's ballpark what we add. Time to the point of return is, yeah, just they're plugging the numbers into the calculation. Any comments on that? Refer to the figure, given the following information about commercial air transport, IFR flight, what is the required taxi fuel? Estimated taxi time, six minutes. APU on for seven minutes. Company policy for flight planning purposes. Taxi fuel should be calculated to use as at least 60 kilograms. All right, what's this information say? So, um, the total fuel quantity required to fly given savior is the sum of the following quantities. Taxi fuel. Quantity required to start up an engine, including APU consumption. Average fuel quantity for start up is five kilograms, so five kgs. Uh, does it say if this is a two engine aircraft? Commercial air transport. Uh, okay, fuel consumption during taxi is five kilograms per minute. And APU consumption is 120 kilograms per hour, so per hour per minute. Observe company policy regarding taxi fuel requirements.
Okay, so expected tax time six minutes and five kilograms. Uh, sorry, I'll just get my little phone up again. So five, that's startup. Um, that was taxi and that was APU. So start is five kilograms, that's fine. Then we've got six minutes at a five kilogram per minute taxi, so that's 30 kilograms. And then APU is on for seven minutes. Um, it's 120 kilograms per hour. So for seven minutes, it's gonna be uh, zero and seven minutes times by 120. Sorry, I'm just quickly doing the calculation here on the uh, calculator. It's gonna be 14 kilograms. So 14 plus 30 plus the five is 49. Even if I'm a bit confused about the uh, start. So average fuel quantity required for startup is that per engine. But even if it is per engine, we add on five kilograms more and get 54 kilograms. And the minimum taxi fuel should be at least 60. So it's gonna be 60. In commercial air transport operations, the purpose of contingency fuel is to include a second alternate aerodrome in the flight planning. No. Provide safety in addition to the required reserve fuel. No. Provide additional fuel when planning to an isolated airfield. No. Compensate for factors that influence the fuel required in an unpredictable well. In unpredictable way. Yes. Number four. It's unpredictable fuel. Refer to Dubrovnik charts from the Jepson manual. How many VFR arrivals to Dubrovnik are published? All right, so this first one, um, that's just the airport information, isn't it? Yes, it is. So we're looking at this. How many VFR arrivals? Are these all VFR arrivals? Let's just check this information up here. Dubrovnik approach. Looks to me like there's one, two, three, four, five. Is it as simple as that? S mm, yes. Five. There's the A2, F2, C2, D2, E. Five. Based off of recognizable points. One, two, three, four, five, and then you come onto it. Uh, downwind leg. Any more clues in here? This is just, yeah, this is just runway. So I'm gonna go for five. Simple as that? Yeah, there you go. Five points for reporting, which are E2, F2, C2, D2, D2, E5. All go to that central point, nice. So for commercial air transport operations over a mountainous area, where the terrain elevation is up to 7,000 feet was the minimum obstacle clearance guaranteed by MOCA. So 7,000 feet, you're thinking MSAs and MOCAs add 2,000 feet if it's 5,001 feet or above. So 2,000 feet is the figure that immediately pops into my head, but these are in meters. So what's the closest to 2,000 feet? I would say 600 meters. Yeah. Minimal obstacle clearance for uh, the en route phase of an IFR is 1,000 feet, which is 300 meters. In mountainous areas, the following applies. Uh, terrain greater than 5,000 feet, obstacle clearance is 2,000. That's exactly what I was saying. Refigure, refer to this figure. Find the true airspeed given the following data. Again, I'm just going to quickly write this stuff down so that when I look at the graph it makes sense so long range cruise 330 minus 63 and 50,500 kgs so quite weird slightly off numbers which makes me think there might be some corrections in here so long range cruise at 330 we are 333 330 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33,
what was the question even asking us? Find the true airspeed. Uh, so true airspeed is down the side here. And we are at 50,500 kgs. So 50,000 kgs and 51,000. So 500 in between that. The true airspeed is going to be 433 knots. Okay, so down the bottom. Optimum weight for pressure altitude is a 58,200. Okay, thrust limited weight for ISA. If it exceeds uh, plus 10 or ISA plus 15, thrust limited weight, thrust limited weight. Adjustments for operation of non standard temperatures. Sorry, I was a bit confused by that first bit. So, increase the fuel required. That's not what we're looking at. We're increasing the true airspeed per one knot degree above ISA and decrease by one knot below ISA. So ISA conditions at 330. On the ground, 15 degrees is ISA, minus two degrees per thousand feet, and uh, 33 times two is 66. So the ISA temperature is gonna be IIS, ISA temperature, is going to be 15 minus 66, uh, quickly doing this on a calculator is minus 51 we're at minus 63 so that is ISA minus 12 so we're going to decrease TAS by one knot per degree below ISA so we've got 433 minus the 12 is going to be 421 uh, is what I get as the answer if we go back in 421. Nice. Okay, this is a lot of information here. Okay, so this looks like it's going to be a fuel breakdown of some sort. Um, given fuel for Mr. Broach at destination 280, fuel for climb to the cruise level 900, cruise distance to the alternate 230, cruise fuel consumption 6.5 kilograms per nautical air mile, fuel for the descent to the alternate. Fuel for the approach and landing of the alternate. Holding fuel flow at the alternate. Fuel for a missed approach to the alternate. The required alternate fuel for this commercial flight is. Okay, so alternate fuel includes the go around cruise arrival at destination. So, at alternate, sorry. So I'm thinking fuel for missed approach to destination, that's got to be included. 280. Now let's uh, get this back up. 280, fuel for climb to the cruise level, 900. Cruise distance is 230, and it's 6.5 kilograms per nautical air mile. So it's gonna be 6.5 times 230. Fuel for the descent, 125. Fuel for the approach and landing of the alternate is 220. Fuel for holding fuel flow for the alternate required alternate fuel for this commercial flight. So it's not talking about final reserve fuel because final reserve fuel is 30 minutes holding um, if it's a jet above the alternate. So I'm going to say it ends there. Is that correct? Well, we'll find out. So quick maths and um, that middle step there, six. 0.5 times 230 is 14.95. So then we just add all these numbers together. I'm getting a value of 3020. When I add all that up, is any of them close? Go for that. Yes. Fuel for a misapproach at the destination. Yep. Yeah. Oh, hide this again. I keep on forgetting that my phone screen's up. Um, apologies. Fuel for a misapproach at the destination 280. Fuel for a climb to cruise level 900. Yes. Cruise fuel consumption 1495. Yes. Fuel for destination toll. Easy. Any comments saying anything? Why don't we need to add the fuel for possible misapproach to the alternate? Is final reserve for it? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Alternate fuels just for getting you to the alternate. Question 14, doing quite well so far. 
making good time, good progress. Ian the Cruise at flight level 155 at 260 knots. The pilot plans for a 500 feet per minute descent in order to fly overhead the Manchester VOR at 2000 feet when the QNH is 1030. TAS will remain constant during the descent. Wind is negligible. Temperature is standard. The pilot must start the descent at a distance of Manchester of. Okay, cool. So this is a good one to draw out. When in doubt, draw the effing picture, I always say. So we're at flight level 155. So that's going to be based off of 1013. Nice straight line there because it's a flight level. Okay, so 155 thousand feet, 15,500 feet, but based off of 1013. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that into the uh, Q and H basically because we're going to be descending down to 2000 feet from a flight level. So Q and H equivalent 1013, the level is going to be below what I've just drawn very handily. So why don't I just go uh, edit this? That's 1013. And then we're going to be adding on a certain distance to get us to 1030, which is the Q and H. Okay, so what is that value? So 1013 to 1030 is 17 times by 30, which is the standard uh, pressure lapse rate. So that's going to be 510 feet more. So this altitude here in terms of Q and H, or our, our altitude, which is always based off of Q and H, is going to be 16,000 and 10 feet. Okay, that's value one. We can delete all this. 16,010 feet, and we're coming down to 2,000 feet. Obviously not to scale. Um, and we need to figure out this distance here, and we're going to work out our time to cover this direction, or kind of go that direction. Yes, okay, cool. I won't confuse things more. We're trying to work out this distance. We're going to have a time, and we've got this distance. Cool. Um, so the vertical distance that we're covering is going to be 16,010 minus the 2,000. Obviously going to be 14,010. Uh, 14,010 and we're doing that 500 feet every minute so it's feet and feet and it's minutes so it's going to give us an answer in terms of minutes so they yeah, I've done this wrong that should be the time so obviously that divided by 500 is going to be about 28 um, minutes important to write down minutes when you're dealing with nautical miles per hour knots and um, feet per minute. It can be quite confusing. So I might just convert that into um, big boy time. That's 0 0.46 minutes. Okay, and then we do the same calculation. We know that we've got the time of 0 0.46 minutes to cover that distance vertically. That means we're going to cover that same distance horizontally. Um, the same, we're going to fly for the same time horizontally as we are flying down the way. And we just figure out the distance using again speed distance time. We've got a true airspeed of 260 knots with no wind conditions to think about. So 260 knots is our uh, speed. Our distance is what we're trying to figure out, and our time is 0 0.46 uh, hours, not minutes, because that was 28 minutes. Uh, we're doing hours, nautical miles per hour, so we'll get a distance that is in terms of nautical miles. It's going to work out 260 multiplied by 0 0.46 gives me a nautical mile distance of 119.6 or 120 ish. So is there 120 in the answers? There is. 
we'll go down and select the bottom one here submit that next one question 15 so while on route during the cruise a pilot is instructed by air traffic control to adjust his or her or their routing increase in the distance to be flown due to military airspace ahead the fuel required for this additional distance is covered by the so taxi trip cafe fuel taxis for taxi trips for trips contingency risk for anything unseen any alternate fuels to fly to the alternate final reserve is uh, about 30 minutes of cruising fuel or 30 minutes of holding fuel or 45 minutes cruising fuel if you are in a piston powered E is any extra and then you can have additional for additional procedures as well. So what is this? This is instructed by ATC to increase the distance flown due to military airspace head. Clearly wasn't planned for, so it wouldn't be covered in the trip. We're not flying to the alternate. We're not using our final reserve of 30 minutes. This seems like unforeseen circumstances, circumstances which is the contingency fuel. Oh, well, there you go. A lot of stuff there. Deviations from forecast meteorological conditions and deviations from planned routings, cruising levels, altitudes. Given the following information, what is the minimum block fuel required for the commercial air transport flight with performance class A airplane using the basic fuel scheme with variations for reduced contingency fuel? Okay, so taxi, trip, Cafe, we're going to do reduced contingency fuel, alternate, final reserve, extra, discretionary. Final reserve is already calculated for it. Cool. All right, so reduced contingency fuel procedure is what we're going to have to look at. So the reduced contingency fuel procedure is the main thing that we need to think about in this term. So the reduced contingency fuel is we have our departure we have a decision point and we have the destination and we also have an alternate and we either take five percent for this bit or we take five percent for this bit whichever is the larger of the two so that we're covered for both so our trip fuel a to dp decision point is twelve thousand kilograms so that's going to be this first bit. So dep to dp equals 12,000 kgs. Trip fuel from the depart dp to the destination is 9,000. Okay, so plus 9,000 for that option. And the other one is going to be 12,000 plus the 3,000 to get to the refueling place. And that's going to be, sorry, I should really draw this better. Then we've got departure to DP equals 12,000 plus the 3,000 to get to the uh, optional refueling place. And the destination alternate for both is 2,000, but that's not included in the um, trip fuel. Therefore, it's not, it not included in the contingency 5% calculation. So we take the larger of the two, which I can already tell is going to be the departure. So 12,000 plus the 9,000 to get to that second leg is 210, yes, 210, 21,000 kilograms for the trip fuel. And that's going to be a larger value than this. So I'm going to just erase this. 21,000 is our trip fuel. And we'll take 5% of that. So trip, 21,000 kilograms. Taxi is going to be 300. Contingency, 5% uh, is going to be 1050 uh, alternate is going to be 2000 and the final reserve 
is going to be 1350. Hopefully that's right. If not, I think I've got the reduced contingency fuel procedure a bit confused. So 300 plus 21,000 plus 21,000? 12 plus 9 is 21, yeah, I suppose. Plus 1050 plus 2000 for the alternate and then plus 1350 for final reserve. So I'm getting a value of 25,700 kgs, which seems quite a lot, but um, we don't know what aircraft it is, I suppose. So 21,000, 25,700 is what I got. And none of these are even close to that. Well, I suppose that one's kind of close. Hmm. So, do I take the lower of the values for the trip fuel contingency value? I think I might, you know. So if we consider our contingency fuel again and see what value. So I took the higher of the two values. So our trip fuel, A to B, A to the destination is 21,000. But we might take the alternate. Yeah, that's a good point. I can't remember off the top of my head. There you go, study point go and relearn the reduced contingency fuel procedure. But I think maybe we go from the trip fuel from the A to the decision point to the refueling, and we take the contingency fuel for the lower, which would be 12,000 plus the 3,000 is the distance from uh, a to the decision point and then decision point to 3000. That's the lower of the two fuel values. So that's going to be 15,000 kilograms. And we'll take 5% of that, which gets us a contingency of 750. And that may, might make a bit of a difference. So we'll add that up again. So doing 300 plus 21,000 plus 750, the contingency option two really, and then add 2000 at 1350, and I get a new answer of 25,400. Is that any of them? No, it's not. Okay, so I think I've got the reduced contingency fuel procedure a bit confused, but 25,400, Jesus, what have I done? Alternate for both possible destinations is 2000. Is it 5% contingency? Yes, it is. Basically, with variations for reduced tax fuel 300. Plus that, plus that. Final reserve 1350. Ah, fuck it, I'll just do this one. Ugh. Oh, right. Oh, there's no explanation for that. What happened to 3% for reduced contingency? It's not the en route alternate procedure, it's the reduced contingency fuel. So regarding this, what happened to not less than 3% of plans, ERA is available. So it's reduced contingency fuel, not en route alternate, 3%, slightly different. And it's the contingency fuel is the for this case, for the reduced contingency fuel procedure, you take 5% of either 12,000 plus 900, uh, plus 9,000, A to B via the decision point, or you go A to the decision point onto the refueling destination. So it's going to be 12,000 plus 3,000. You take 5% of that value. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to have to go and look at that, basically. But that's what this is all about. That's what um, doing a study session like this is all about. Learning a little bit more for the, uh, the real thing. So we're going to have a look at that. Question 17 then. Refer to Amsterdam, this chart from this thing. What does EH048 indicate? EH048. Let's find you. Oof, not very good quality. EH048, where are you? There. EH048 is, this is a departure, is it? It's a 
it, yes. So you take off south, you turn, and you fly up. There's no speed constraint. You don't even have to fly over. It's a fly by turning to 284. Uh, 8248, yeah, cool. Okay, fly by, yeah. Except for aircraft. I know. That's. It's got except for Boeing 737s because it's trying to confuse you with this point, 080. So 048, no indication for 737s. So it's a flyby waypoint. No? Surely that's wrong. What's it say in this? Yeah, try and read what it says at the bottom here. So 048, RNAV on track 183, so south to 048, then to 049, blah, 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 080, 030 to 057. Hey, a bit confused by that. The figure illustrate two types of waypoints used in aviation, fly by and fly overs. A flyby waypoint allows aircraft to start turning just before reaching the waypoint. Yes, 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 yes. This is the most efficient. On the other hand, the flyover the aircraft must pass directly over the waypoint before initiating a turn. Flyover waypoints are distinguished. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so at the bottom it says, according to the description of the EHAM, uh, EHAM, the Amsterdam chart, all aircraft except 737 are required to fly over the 048 RNAV, appro RNAV waypoint. Therefore, for these aircraft types, 048 is a flyby waypoint. However, for 737, it's a flyover. 737, EH080, then 030 to 057. Mm. Ooh, 43 comments. People are not happy with this one. It needed several minutes, so let's see what Ralph says. But I got it. First statement, it is a flyby point. Correct. Second statement, it isn't a point for the 737 at all. So the answer is right. It's a flyby for 737 because the 737 never uses this point. Right. So in the explanation, sorry, Boeing 737 doesn't have to fly using this point at all because it never flies over 084, it just goes zzz, and then it turns up to 05080, 00, and then up to 057. So it just goes and then turns around, it doesn't even use the point at all. If, uh, okay, right. That's a tricky one. Right, question 18, we're almost there. Refer to figure or flight planning manual, figure 431C. So for a flight of 2,000 ground nautical miles cruising at 30,000 feet within the limits of the data given, a headwind of 25 knots will affect the time by approximately... Cap 697 I actually have open here. So we've got 2,000 nautical miles. This is going to be quite tricky because I'm just actually might get a ruler and attach my ruler to the screen just so it's a bit easier but 2000 comes up it bounces across from a pressure altitude of 30,000 feet and we're looking at what is it time increase yes we're going all the way up to the top so 2000 up to 290 and above so I'm now currently just sticking a ruler to my screen um, so 2000 comes up, it bounces off of this line about this point here according to my ruler and then we're going straight across and there's no ISA deviation to speak of and I'm getting a time there. I'd say it's just at the bottom of that black line which is 
5, 4.75, let's call it, um, as the time, 4.75 hours. And then if we got 25 knot headwind, we'd start again from the bottom, go up to the reference line. 25 knot headwind pushes us up to the next waypoint. Um, 2000, basically touching the black line, yeah. And then 25 knot correction, I'm getting us about there. This is really hard to do without the pen and paper. I could have just printed it off, but oh well. Up to about there, and then we'll go across again. I'm getting an answer of, really annoyingly, I'd say five, let's just go five hours. So what is that? We've got 4.75 and five hours. So it's looking for a percentage increase. So the difference there is 0.25 hours divided by 4.75 times by 100. 5% increase? No. 5.26, 7 7.6, let's go 7.6. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to do with my, so it's saying 4.8 and 5.15, it's being more precise because you can actually draw the lines rather than just slapping a ruler at a screen. But there you go, it's increased the time by 35, uh, 0.35 hours, which is 7.3% uh, increase. Right, so the highest obstacle located within eight kilometers of a specific IFR route is 1,220 feet. What is the minimum altitude providing the required obstacle clearance? The minimum altitude. Okay, so we want to add a thousand feet, round up to the nearest hundred. That's for MSA, I suppose. Um, it's not asking us the minimum altitude required, required, required obstacle clearance. 12, 20, add a thousand, two, two, zero. And then IFR, we want to fly at mm -hmm, 12 to 80. You normally ride up to 100 for MSA, so I'm going to go 2300. No, 12 to 80. It's looking for just the altitude, it's not looking for the MSA. Numbers are from everywhere over mountains, 2000, 1000. Clearance, yeah, to it. I was trying to be too smart, too clever. MSA, round it up. If it's just asking you clearance altitude, that's all it's asking. So an aircraft is on a defined RMP2 route, so we've got to be accurate between two nautical miles for 95% of the time. And it's approaching a waypoint where the track change of 40 degrees is required. The route is part of a system with four parallel routes and reliable separation between the aircraft on different routes is essential. Which of the following types of FMS coding of the waypoint will ensure lateral separation between aircraft during the turn? What a horrible question for people who have never flown an aircraft that uses a, a flight management system. But four parallel routes. Okay, so let's just draw this out so we can think. So four parallel routes, let's go. We don't need to think about all four of them. We can just think about two of them. A track change of 40 degrees is required. So we're doing this and they're all going to be parallel like that. Which of the following SMS coding of the waypoint at this point here, let's say, will ensure lateral separation between aircraft also during the turn. So fly by, we might cut the corner like this and that might make us uh, not have the lateral separation required. So I don't think it's going to be flyby. Radius to fix path terminator. I don't even know what that is, to be honest. Uh, fly over a waypoint. That seems to make sense to me. We both fly over our waypoints before making the turns. And fixed radius transition. I'm going to go fly over. No, fixed radius transition. 
don't even know what that is. So let's have a look. So this document discusses fixed radius, which have two forms. The first is a raised fixed leg. Da, 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 da. The fixed radius path is defined by radius, arc length, and fix. RMP systems can conform to track keeping accuracy during turns as well as straight line segments. Bank angle limits are considered in procedure design. The second form of fixed radius path is designed for on route procedures. So this is what we're talking about and creates a fixed radius between two route segments. The RMP system is responsible for creating this turn due to the technicalities of the procedure data definition. These turns have two possible radii based on, fixed based on the altitude of the route and their use in RNAV air TS routes and can improve airspace issues through. Wow, very wordy. Um, that's what it's saying, it's worked out two radiuses that allow you to do the turn between these two points. Not the nicest question for somebody who's never used an FMS, or even if somebody like me who uses an FMS basically every day, I have no idea that it was called a fixed radius transition. So finish, we got a few wrong, maybe two or three, 80%, not bad, four wrong, not two or three. So let's have a look back, review our test. So we've got question four wrong, that was a confusing one. Um, what else did we get wrong? Oh, didn't do very good at the end, did we? 17, yeah, confusing. Is it for a 737? No, because 737 just don't use it at all. So it is a flyby waypoint, but 737s just don't use it. Why they get special treatment, I don't know. 19, yeah, don't be too smart. It didn't ask the MSA, it just asked for the minimum altitude. And the last one there, I had no idea about that, to be honest. That's something new I've learned today. And go back and finish. So you see we took 57 minutes. Uh, hopefully the video won't be that long. I did a few uh, mistakes and messing up. So I've edited a bit of it out. And average time per question, 2.85. Uh, and that's it, really. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, this was just a little study session, we've learned a few things, so we know what we're going to go and look at. We're going to go revise a bit of the reduced contingency fuel procedure and probably have a look at some FMS stuff because I didn't know exactly what was going on there in that last question. And we'll use that information in the live stream exam, which will be coming up. Make sure and keep track of the Instagram and the YouTube and see when the date is because I haven't confirmed that yet. And that's all. Thank you very much. Peace.